So in this class, we're going to be dealing with constructive sales. Constructive sales are governed by code section 1259. Well, what's really interesting about this code section is you, is you really see the interaction between Congress and taxpayers. Taxpayers entered into a transaction um, which gave them incredibly good results. Congress didn't like those results. They enacted code section 1259. And, I was, and we'll go into greater detail, obviously, of what, what was going on. And after Code Section 1259 was enacted, taxpayers still wanted to reach similar results. Um, and we'll see what's happened after that. Um, new transactions have been developed. They comply with Section 1259, or they don't invoke Section 1259. Um, taxpayers are getting the results they wanted. Um, albeit not as good as they were able to get before the enactment of Section 1259. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, in today's class, uh, I'm not going to be using the whiteboard as much. I think the PowerPoint slides um, have a lot more numbers and have a lot more detail in it than normal. I will still use the power. I still will use the whiteboard on occasion. Um, but more, a lot of the things that we're going to cover are just going to be covered in the PowerPoint. So that might actually be easier for you. So we're going to deal with constructive sales. And that's what, so that's what this is all about. Code section 1259, constructive sales. Um, it's another one of these anti-abuse sections. Congress perceived the taxpayers were entering into abusive transactions. They enacted section 1259 to stop these transactions from happening. And what have they done? They've created something called a constructive sale. Because it's constructive, that means that the sale never occurs for legal purposes. Um, the taxpayer owns property. They enter into a transaction that has an impact on their economic um, ownership, their economic interest in the property. It reduces their risk of loss. It eliminates their potential for gain. But legally, they haven't sold it. They're still the owner of that property. But for tax purposes, they're going to be treated as though they sold the property. Um, and to the extent there, there is any unrealized gain in that property, they're going to have to recognize the gain. So that's what 1259 is doing. It's going to create um, sales where no sales have actually occurred. So when did all this happen? This all happened in 1997. So prior to 1997, what, what was the facts? What happened that led Congress to put in this code section? And so here's an example. Um, a taxpayer owns appreciated stock. They own a million shares of IBM, zero basis, fair market value of $100 million. And the taxpayer would sell a million shares short. So remember when we did short sales, um, we owned shares and we sold short substantially identical shares. That didn't trigger a taxable event. Those were treated as two separate um, events, two separate transactions. And we saw how when we closed the short sale, um, we would create long-term losses or we would create short-term gains. But when we entered into the short sale, it was never treated as actually selling the long stock. That's no longer true in a lot of circumstances. Um, so what happened when they sell the share short? They have to post the $100 million as collateral to the lender of the stock. So if you remember um, in, our, in our short sale example, um, you know what, I will use the whiteboard. Here. Um, we're going to sell short $100 million of IBM stock. So let's, go, let's draw the diagram again of a short sell. So let's remember that. We have the short seller. 
we have the lender of the securities, and we have the buyer. So again, we have a short seller. We have the lender. And we have the buyer. And then let's just, again, go with, the, with all the flows. So what's going to happen is we're going, going to be cash going this way. There's going to be stock going this way. There's going to be cash going this way and stock going up here. Let me put on all the labels. So we have stock. We have cash. We have cash going from the buyer to the short seller, and then we have stock. So the stock starts with the lender, goes up to the short seller, gets transferred to the buyer. The buyer takes the $100 million, gives it to the short seller, and the short seller gives cash to the lender. And that was our normal short sell. But now, in addition to being short the stock, the short seller also owns the stock. So if the short seller is short a million share, a hundred million dollars worth of stock, and they also own a hundred million dollars worth of stock, they have no risk of loss with respect to that stock. And, and I'll come back to the PowerPoint and I'll show you how that all works. But they own a million shares and they have a liability to return a million shares. And they now have a hundred million dollars of cash sitting with the lender and the lender knows that they also own the stock. So the lender says, look, I'm, I'm keeping the short sale um, proceeds as, um, as collateral, even though I know that you're really, there's no way you're not gonna be able to make good on giving me my back my stock because you own the stock. And so you then say to the lender, since you know that, and since you know I own the stock, what I'd like you to do is lend me money. And the lender of the stock which is a broker dealer, will also then lend the short seller cash. So in a separate transaction, there's more cash coming up to the short seller. And it's actually equal to 95% of the value of the stock. So, Look at what's happened. The short seller has stock, and let's assume that we have zero basis. We have $100 million of value. And what have they done? They've sold short the stock, and they now have $100 million on deposit with the lender, and then they borrow $95 million. So now they have $95 million of cash that they can do whatever they want with. And they haven't triggered any taxable event. Um, on the $100 million that they have as collateral, if you remember, they're earning interest. So let's assume that they're earning um, 3%. On the 95 million that they're borrowing, they're paying interest. So this is a borrowing. And let's assume they're paying three and a quarter percent. Well, they're paying three and a quarter percent on 95 million, they're earning 3% on a hundred million, it, it, it's, it's a very low cost. It's gonna be a quarter of 1%. So 1% on a hundred million is a million dollars. It's gonna be less than $250,000. 
And so they're going to pay $250,000 a year next and be able to have 95 million in cash and not pay the tax. And then the beauty of all of this, although it's not so beautiful to the person when it happens, but when the person dies, if this is an individual, when the person dies, and again, remember, we talked about this, what basis do the heirs take over in the stock? They take over its fair market value. So the heirs get a basis of $100 million. They then deliver the stock Close the short. What was the amount realized on the short? $100 million. What's their basis in the stock? $100 million. Zero gain on closing. There's $100 million of cash sitting as collateral. There's a borrowing of $95 million. The cash collateral goes to pay off the debt. They free up the, the last $5 million of cash. And what do you know? They've converted the $100 million of IBM stock into $100 million of cash, and they never paid a dollar of tax. So that's what was going on prior to 1997. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. And that's what all this is saying. So the short sale would um, be deemed to be an open transaction. Eventually the taxpayer dies. The estate gets a step up in basis. They deliver the stock against the short. The cash in the account pays off the debt. And guess what? This is too good to be true, but it was going on for decades. And then finally something happened. And by the way, these are the economics of a short against the box. Um, the blue line going from the bottom left to the upper right um, is your risk and reward with respect to the long position, the stock that you own. The orange line going from the top left to the bottom right, um, that's the economic risk and reward with respect to the short position. And as you can see, the gray line going across the middle, that's the net position. It never changes. It's a perfect hedge. Um, there is no longer any risk of loss. There is no potential of gain with respect to that stock, but we haven't created a tax event, yet we've been able to extract all the cash. And as I said, Congress said, you know what? This is too good to be true. Um, and here, for those of you, um, so I know you're all accountants or you all work for an accounting firm anyway. If you look at the balance sheet of this transaction, We've got a million shares of IBM. Um, there's an obligation, the, and so they own a million shares of IBM. They have an obligation to deliver a million shares of IBM. It doesn't matter what the value of IBM is because their ownership is in shares. Their liability is denominated in shares. The two of those completely offset. They have short sale proceeds of $100 million. That's an asset that's going to earn interest. They then borrow $95 million from the broker. Um, and then they take that 95 million and they diversify. They buy a, a new portfolio or they do whatever they want to do with that money. Um, they could go buy uh, a, a football team or a basketball team or a yacht or whatever they want to do with that money, they can do with that money. Um, and they're not paying any tax. So this is what it looks like from a balancing point of view. Um, you've in effect converted $100 million of IBM into $95 million of a diversified portfolio and an additional $5 million of cash that you have to leave in your account. And as I said, what's happening income and expense wise, you're earning rebate on the short sale proceeds. So you're earning interest on this $100 million on the asset side. You're paying interest on the debt. And the interest rates on the two stay very close to each other. Um, what you do is you, know, you negotiate a spread. So my example, I use 25 basis points as the spread. On this one, I'm using 50 basis points as the spread. And 50 basis points is probably closer. So you're earning 3% interest, and you're borrowing 3.5% interest. 
um, on a pre-tax basis that comes out to about $325,000 using a 37% tax rate because it's deductible. Um, you end up with $204,750 in after-tax expense. And what's your benefit? Um, assuming um, you're, you're going to save over $23 million in taxes um, if we take the 20% tax rate plus the um, tax on that investment income. Um, and the saving is permanent when the person dies. So for $204,000 a year, you're saving $23 million in tax. Um, you then have the money to spend. So if you can earn $204,000 um, or, or on a pre-tax basis, if you could earn $325,000 on $23 million, this is worth doing. Um, so, you know, it's a fraction of what you have to, of what you would have to earn. Um, it's a little over 1%. So if you could earn 2% on your money, this is worth doing. So what happened? Why did Congress say this finally has to end? Um, in 1996, there was a company called Estee Lauder Company, um, the perfume company, a cosmetics company. And the matriarch of the family, Estee Lauder, was the major shareholder of the company, but the whole family owned the company. And they decided to go public. So they went through an, an IPO, an initial public offering. And when and the lawyers decided they wanted to get out of their stock. And they thought this was great because when they start selling the stock to the public, this gives them a chance to get to actually put their stock in the hands of the public and they're able to get out. Except if they all got out, they all had zero basis stock, they were all going to have to pay a tax on the gain. So what did they do? They all lent each other their stock. So Estee Lauder lent her stock to her husband. Her husband lent his stock to his daughter, his daughter. The daughter lent her stock to the brother. The brother lent the stock back to the mother. And everyone was in effect doing a short sale because they were all selling each other's borrowed stock. And so they were all short against the box. Um, they all technically still own their stock and they were just selling shares that they didn't own. Um, and so they were all short against the box. Now, no physical stock remained with them. That's what's crazy about all this. But technically they still uh, own their stock in a, in a very formalistic way because all they did was they lent it out to someone and then that person sold it to someone else. So none of the family members recognized any gain on this transaction. The problem with this transaction is because it was an initial public offering, this had to be disclosed in the documents to, to the people buying the stock. Um, and once this was spelled out in the documents, some reporter read about this um, they worked for Newsweek, and they wrote a story about this, saying, look at what's going on. Estee Lauder is going public. There's hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of income that's not being um, taxed, and this is the way they did the transaction. And when things get published in Newsweek, um, people in Congress read the stories, um, see what's going on. And it took about six to nine months, but then Congress enacted code section 1259. So finally, something that was too good to be true was no longer going to be um, too good to be true because it wasn't going to be true anymore. Okay, so what does code section 1259 say? Code section 1259 says, um, if, if there is a constructive sale of an appreciated financial position, the taxpayer shall recognize gain as if the position was actually sold for its fair market value. So the first bullet is telling us if there's something called a constructive sale and constructive sales only apply to appreciated financial position, then we're going to treat it as though you really sold it. And um, if there is gain, you have to recognize the gain. Um, the second bullet is proper adjustment shall be made and the amount of any gain or loss subsequently realized with respect to such position uh, by reason of constructive sale. So what does that mean in English? 
Um, I do a constructive sale this year. I do the $100 million. I pick up $100 million of gain. Well, I still own the stock, and they're not telling me to adjust my basis. So next year, I close out the short position, and then I sell my stock, and I sell my stock for $80 million. Well, if I didn't um, adjust my basis, when I sell my stock for $80 million, I now have an $80 million um, gain. But because I've already recognized $100 million in a prior year, um, I'll, I'll actually have a $20 million loss. So I'll, I'll do that on the whiteboard. So whenever I do numbers, I like doing them on the whiteboard. So let's get rid of this diagram. Let's move this up here. Let's erase. And I don't know a way to erase the whole thing at once, unfortunately. So you have to bear with me. So again, we've got zero basis. We've got a hundred million dollar fair market value. I do a constructive sale. And I recognize one hundred million of gain. And then sometime in the future, I actually sell the stock. Um, for $80 million. Well, 80 million is my amount realized. And what's my basis? My basis is still zero. Because there was no basis adjustment due to the constructive sale. So that's my basis. So when I do this, I go, uh oh, look at what I have. I have an $80 million gain. However, I already recognized $100 million. In, a, in the prior year. So I get to subtract that because I don't have to pay tax twice. So that's the prior gain. And so now, not only do I not, no longer have a gain, but I actually have a $20 million loan. Right? And that makes sense because economically, when everything is all said and done, I had $80 million of gain. I recognized $100 million of gain in year one. And now when I get rid of it, I should have a $20 million loss. And that nets out to $80 million of gain. The problem is this loss is going to be a capital loss. Um, the $100 million of gain was a capital gain, and it was in a prior year. So I've got a, a real problem, um, because I can't carry back my loss. Remember, we could carry back losses for Section 1256 contracts. I can't just carry back normal capital losses. Um, so while I end up with an $80 million gain in this transaction, which is the right number, um, because of the way we're recognizing it, I might actually recognize $100 million of gain in year one and a $20 million loss in year two. Um, and if I can't carry back that loss, that's a problem. So if you're going to do a constructive sale, just get rid of the stock. Just don't do constructive sales if you can avoid them. Okay, so let's go back to the PowerPoint. Um, if I do enter into a constructive sale, remember, I've never disposed of the property. I still have the property. Since I still have the property, I've got to say, okay, what is my holding period in that property? And the holding period starts all over again. 
So I've held my IBM stock. I held it for 20 years. I do a constructive sale. I now continue to be long and short the IBM. My holding period starts anew. But remember, because of um, the straddle rules, because of the short sale rules, I'm never going to get holding period in that stock as long as um, I keep the short position open. Now, they couldn't make the rules retroactive. So that if you did a constructive sale, if you did a short against the box prior to the time this law was enacted, that's it. You got away with it. You didn't have to pay tax on the gain. But what they did do is they said, by the way, if you entered into one of these short against the box positions prior to the date of enactment, we're no longer going to allow a step up in basis when you die. So remember the beauty of this, one of the really nice things about this transaction is that when the person died, their heirs got a step up in basis, they could deliver the long against the short. Um, that wouldn't trigger any gain, or if it did, it triggered a very small gain, or it could actually have triggered a loss, um, but they would end the transaction. This transaction now goes on forever and ever, which the brokers love, because remember, the brokers are making that 50 basis points on the position. As long as the position stays open, they keep making 50 basis points. Um, someone dies now, and now the heirs have to keep the position open because they don't want to pay the tax. Since they're not getting a step up in basis, the basis remains at zero. The short sale proceeds all, are always $100 million. They're going to trigger $100 million of gain if they ever close the position. So now the heirs will keep the position open. So this actually ended up being a bonanza for the brokerage firms that are holding these positions open for their clients. Okay, so, so now we know that there's a constructive sale if you have an appreciated financial position. So the first thing we're gonna do is what is an appreciated financial position? And an appreciated financial position is a position with respect to stock, debt, or a partnership interest. Um, and so if you have your own shares of stock, your own debt, your own partnership interest, if there would have been gain on a sale or disposition of that position, then if you enter into a constructive sale, we're going to trigger the gain. And we haven't gotten into the transactions yet that lead to a constructive um, sale, and I will do that. Um, and a position also means an interest, in, including but not limited to a futures, a forward contract, a short sale, an option, so an option on stock, an option on debt, an option on a partnership interest, short sales, if they've appreciated in value, um, are also treated as appreciated financial position. Something that's missing from here is cryptocurrency. What do you know? Um, if I own Bitcoin and Bitcoin has gone up in value, I can enter into a short sale of the Bitcoin and section 1259 doesn't apply. Um, there is no constructive sale. I haven't sold the Bitcoin. I don't have to recognize the gain and I should be able to pull out a very large percentage, the same 95% of the value because I own the Bitcoin and I'm short the Bitcoin. There's no risk to the dealer lending me the money as long as they have possession of my Bitcoin. Um, so right now, cryptocurrencies are not subject to 1259. Now I'm recording this um, in the beginning of the year and you're not seeing this until June. Um, between now and the time you see it, Congress might change the law. So if Congress changes the law, um, I will put that in the material um, in the course. I'm not going to redo this presentation if that's the only thing that changes. If other things change, and I have to, and I'll, then I'll redo this presentation. Otherwise, I will put it in the notes um, to remind everybody that if Congress changes the law and makes cryptocurrencies, subject to the constructive sale rules. Like I said, I will let you know. Um, not all debt is our subject is treated as an appreciated financial position. If I just have regular debt of a US treasury bond and it's appreciated in value, that's not an appreciated financial position. Um, if it's convertible debt, so I have debt that's convertible into stock of IBM, the stock of Apple, and that debt has gone up in value, that is an appreciated financial position. Um, also, any position that's marked to market under any provisions of the code 
are not appreciated financial position. And the logic there is that at the end of the year, we're going to mark to market those um, assets and you're gonna recognize the gain anyway. So if you wanna go do a constructive sale, go do a constructive sale. You're not really accomplishing anything. So what is a construct constructive sale? First, it's not an actual sale of the property. That's the key thing. We haven't really sold the property, but we're gonna treat it as a sale for tax purposes. So the first one is easy. If you enter into a short sale, a substantial identical property, guess what? You have a constructive sale. So we own IBM shares, we sell the IBM short, we have a constructive sale. Um, we enter into a swap, an offsetting NPC. NPC is notional principal contract with respect to substantially identical property. So now we're starting to see the things that we've learned about previously. If they're gonna give you the same economic effects, we're gonna treat them the same um, under the constructive sale rules. Congress has gotten a lot smarter um, about understanding economics and understanding securities. And they realize there's more than one way to accomplish the same goal using financial instruments. Um, they then said, if you enter into a future con futures contract or a forward contract to sell substantially identical property, to deliver substantially identical property, guess what? That's a constructive sale as well. So if I own a, a million shares of IBM and I enter into a contract to deliver a million shares of IBM to you um, in a year from now for a fixed price, that's a constructive sale. Even though we haven't sold it yet for tax purposes, I've sold it. Um, if the appreciated position is a short position, then if you buy it back, um, the acquisition of substantially similar property is going to be treated as a constructive sale. I, I, I don't like the word sale. I would do constructive closing, but we've actually closed the short sale then for tax purposes. The thing that's missing here are options. And is it, it, so you might think that's odd because I could do, um, I could, buy a put and sell a call with identical strike prices and identical expiration dates. And I've in effect created um, a contract to sell, right? We, going back to the very first day of class, um, we talked about how using puts and calls could create um, ownership in property and vice versa, a sale of the property. Um, so they really didn't forget about it. They just didn't know what rules to write. And so they said in the legislation that regulations are going to be written for transactions that have the same or similar effect of the above mentioned transactions. And they specifically mentioned options and option collars. Um, now remember these rules were written in 1997, in July of 1997. And they said, don't worry about these regulations. They're going to come out um, by the end of the year, by Christmas. The only problem is they didn't say Christmas of what year. So here we are 25 years later um, and we still haven't gotten those regulations. Um, however, um, the market has come up with its own rules. So let's just go to the next slide. Um, I'm gonna come back to the next slide because I wanna talk about collars. So what is a collar? Um, the taxpayer owns stock worth $10 million. And what they do is they buy puts with a strike price of nine and a half million dollars. And they sell calls with a strike price of $11,500,000. So if they're buying a put with a strike price of nine and a half million dollars, that means they can force the seller of the put to buy their stock from them for nine and a half million dollars. So if the price of the stock goes down to $7 million, they don't care, they can exercise their put, they can deliver the stock and they'll receive nine and a half million dollars. So that's the downside. They've now protected their downside. What they're also going to do is they're going to sell calls with a strike price of $11,500,000. And what does that mean? That means if IBM or whatever the stock is goes above $11.5 million, it's going to be called away from them. So if it goes up to $14 million, let's say, the buyer of the call option is gonna say, give me that stock and I'll give you $11.5 million. So what you've done is you've retained some economic exposure, it's this collar. Um, you've taken some, you still have some downside risk and you have some upside potential. 
And the, the amount that, in this case, that you would have retained is a 20% interest in the stock. Um, in the examples in the regulations, I just want to go back. Uh, yeah, so in the examples in the regulations dealing with collars, um, the committee report where they tell the treasury to write the regulations, um, say that the regulations, when, when and if they're ever written, they, like I said, they still haven't been written, are going to be prospective, except for abuse of collars. And when they said that, they gave an example um, of a put struck at 95% and a call struck at 110% of the stock price. And most people like myself um, believe that when they gave an example, they didn't give an example of an abusive transaction. So they said, this is an example that many people are entering into and we wanna let you know how it's going to be governed. So most people, many people believe, I'm not gonna say most, many people believe that a collar with a 15% band and going out not more than five years should be okay and shouldn't violate these rules. The New York State Bar Association, which is very highly respected in the United States, they write comments to the Treasury and to Congress about legislation that's either been passed or proposed. Um, and they don't always take a pro taxpayer point of view. And so they're given a lot of weight. And they submitted a proposal saying, look, you're not writing regulations. We don't know what to do with this. So we propose that if you will, you should always allow a 20% ban, again, if it's, as long as it's not more than five years. Uh, we don't want people doing 100 year collars and just having a 20% ban. But if it's less than five years, a 20% ban um, means that they've retained enough economic risk and reward with respect to the stock or the appreciated financial position that they shouldn't have to trigger a gain. And that 20% ban has actually become the industry norm. So you will typically see um, collars with a 20% band, and that's the reason that they use the 20% band. There's nothing in the law that says the 20% is okay. There's nothing in the law that says 15% is bad. If you want to be a little more aggressive, I would use a 15% band. If you're going to do a transaction for, let's say, six months, I would go even tighter. Um, I might use a 10% band. Um, there's just, but there's just nothing in the law that you can point to. The only thing you can point to in the law are these committee reports and they show a 15% ban. So if you're gonna do a 20% ban, you really should be safe. So here are the numbers again, and then let's look at a chart. So when you see the chart, it's easy to understand and you can visualize the collar. Um, the blue line is the stock if it's unhedged. So it's just this 45 degree angle. Um, it'll go down to 30 and as high as 70. In, these, in this example. The red lines show you what your economic exposure is when you buy the put and you buy the call. So what we did here was the stock on the trade date had a value of $50. We have a put with a strike price of 45, a call with a strike price of 55. The 10 point difference is based on a $50 stock, so it's the same 20%. Um, assume that the put and the call are the same price. You didn't have to lay out any value. When the minimum value that you're guaranteed is $45 a share, because if the price goes below $45, um, the area between the blue and the red line on the left, you don't lose that value. You're able to put the stock, you're always going to get $45 a share. On the other side, if the stock goes up above 55, you're giving up that value. You're giving up that increase. So you're giving up the difference between the red and the blue line on the upper right. Um, and you're willing to do that because you really want to get out of this stock. You just don't want to pay tax. And by doing this collar, you've retained some downside, you've retained some upside, but there's no tax liability. And then you can borrow against the $45 minimum price. Dealers will lend you um, they'll lend you $45 and then you can take the $45 and do with it as you please. So this isn't as good as the short against the box, but it's pretty close. And this is the transaction that people do now for the last 20 years, 25 years. These are the transactions that people do um, to get around the constructive sale rule, but still um, get out of appreciated positions more or less. Um, free up the cash inside the position, not pay tax, 
and live with some um, risk of loss and some potential for gain. And when they die with one of these positions on, you do get a step up in basis. And that's when you eliminate all the, um, the tax on all the unrecognized gain. So this is the transaction that people now do um, to get around the constructive sale rule. Um, let me just go back to a couple of, um, go back a couple of slides. So we have the constructive sale, we've entered into a short sale. Um, and so people started complaining to Congress and said, you know, wait a second, I've got all this um, stock, let's say IBM stock, and I have zero basis, the stock is worth $10 million, and, uh, and the IBM is going to come out with earnings tomorrow. And when companies come out with earnings, typically their stock either goes up a lot or down a lot, but it's usually not a passive day for an investor. And so this investor is very concerned and they wanna hedge their IBM stock. And, say, and so they say, you know what? I could sell my IBM stock, but if I sell my IBM stock, I've got to, I'm gonna trigger the, get the tax on $10 million. That's ridiculous. Um, I don't wanna buy puts on the stock because they're expensive. What I'd really like to do is sell it short. That's a perfect hedge. Um, and it's not, it's not expensive, it's very easy to do. And I'm just hedging myself. And so Congress said, you know what? You're right, we're gonna let you do that. Um, so, we gave, so we're gonna give you an exception. If you do a constructive sale, you sell stock short and you close the constructive sale by the 30th day following the year end, and then you continue to hold the appreciated position for an additional 60 days, and at no time during that 60 day period do you hedge your position, then we're gonna treat it as though you didn't enter into a constructive sale. So let me go to the whiteboard and let's go through an example of how that works. And by the way, this is a very dangerous um, exception to rely on. And on, after I do this, we'll go back to the PowerPoint. I'll show you some of the track. Hi, um, sorry. When I want to erase, I sometimes hit stop share. So I apologize for that. Let's make this big. Okay, so again, we have our stock. We have our zero basis. We have our 100 million fair market value. And I wanna hedge myself, so I sell short 100 million. And we do it on June 15th. I can buy back the short um, anytime. Or, you know, instead of saying buy back, because that's a trap, that's one of the traps, I can close the short um, anytime. prior to 1.30 of the following year. And then remain unhedged. For 60 days. Um, in the stock in the appreciated position. And I will meet the exception. To the constructive sale. So you can enter into a short sale of identical stock, but you have to know that you have to close the short sale prior to January 30th of the following year. So what are the traps? So there are a couple of traps. The first thing you have to remember is that it's January 30th. And when you're reading the code and when we're talking about it now, you go, well, what kind of trap is that? 
that everyone can read. Everyone knows it's January 30th. People tend to forget that. And a lot of people just think it has to be done by the end of January. And all of a sudden, January 30th becomes January 31st. And guess what? You missed by a day, you missed. It's not close. Um, it's, like if, it's like if you're being pregnant. Either you're pregnant or you're not pregnant. Either you did it by January 30th or you didn't. The other thing is you have to close the short cell. So if you remember, how do you close a short cell? You close a short cell by making delivery. So you might think that, oh, I did the short sell. I'm going to buy back the stock. on January 31st, on January 30th, I'm sorry. See, I've already fallen into the trap. I called it January 31st. I buy back stock on January 30th. And I think I've met the exception. Well, guess what? You didn't meet the exception. Remember when you buy stock, when does the stock, when does it settle? It settles in two business days. So if I buy it on January 30th, the earliest I can get the stock is February 1st. So I can deliver on 2-1. Well, 2-1 is after January 30th. I haven't met the exception. Um, so these are traps. This is the way that you can really mess things up. Um, and a lot of people just aren't aware of it. They don't think about it. Um, but this is part of the reason that I don't like this exception. The other thing is, in my stock, I had a hundred million dollars of unrealized gains. And I do the hedge, and it's nice that I did the hedge because the stock went down in value. And so now I've got a $90 million unrealized gain in the stock. And remember, I was perfectly hedged. And so if I'm perfectly hedged, that means I've got a $10 million um, gain on the short position. So I still have my $100 million of gain. The problem is I have to close it out. Um, short, not opposition, but position. And when I close out the short, I have to recognize the gain. So not only am I recognizing the $10 million gain, but the gain is all short-term gain because it's on a short sell. So I'm actually converting the long-term gain into short-term gain every time I have to close out the position um, to meet the exception. And then the final thing is, um, what happens if I die? I sell it short on June 15th and I die on November 1st. Well, my tax year ends on November 1st. On November 1st, did I meet the exception? And the answer is no. I sold it short on June 15th. My tax year ends November 1st. No one cares what I do between November 1st and January 30th. It doesn't affect me anymore, which means I now have a constructive sale. Let's assume that I'm lucky and I close the short on 1.30 or to be safe on 125. And now I have to stay unhedged for 60 days. And now I die on February 1st. Well, my tax year ends on February 1st. And when my tax year ends on February 1st, did I hold the stock on hedge for 60 days? The answer is no. And if the answer is no, I didn't meet the exception. I have a constructive sale on 
on 615 of the prior year. I never met the exception. So there are a lot of ways to mess up this exception. Death is like the worst answer, obviously. But if, when you die, you're probably going to trigger the constructive sale. Um, and then the January 30th versus January 31st, and just remembering that you have to close the short sale as opposed to buying back the stock is just another trap. Um, so it's an exception that's there. Be very careful if you're going to rely on it. Um, Okay, so the first tool that we're going to use to get around the constructive sale rules are collars made up of puts and calls. Another thing that Wall Street has come up with is something called the prepaid variable forward contract. So what you do is you enter into a forward contract to deliver the share to deliver shares, but the number of shares varies with the price of the stock. And they basically put the terms of the puts in the call into this forward contract. So what they say is if the stock goes below 95% of its original value, the investor delivers all of their stock. So the investor retains 5% of the downside. Um, and then below that, there's no more downside that the investor is retaining because they're just going to deliver the stock and they're going to get 95% of the value. If the stock goes over 115% of its original value, um, the taxpayer delivers a number of shares that allows it to retain 15%. So it's going to keep the 15% increase. It's going to deliver the rest. And it's a prepaid variable forward contract, which means on the day that the taxpayer enters into the contract, they get money up front. And that money is non-taxable. Um, so they're going to get the 95%. Um, and then it's going to be discounted for interest because you're getting the money up front, you're not delivering the stock for let's say three years. Let's say we do this forward contract and it's in three years that you're gonna deliver the stock, then you've in effect borrowed the money for three years and they're gonna charge you interest on that. Um, the economics are exactly the same as the economics of entering into a collar and you would have entered into a collar and borrowed against the put strike price. That's what this is doing. Um, it's the same exact economics. Um, finally, we could do an equity swap, right? Um, we do a swap. I now am going to pay you the increase in the value of the stock to, if, to the extent that it exceeds uh, 115%. So if the stock was worth 100 million, if the value of the stock goes above 115 million, I'll pay you that excess. And so I get to keep the first 15 million. If the stock goes below 95 million, um, you're going to pay me that amount. And so I'm protected below 95 million. It's the same exact um, economics as the collar and the prepaid variable forward. You can then borrow against the equity in the swap position from the dealer that you've entered into the swap with. Um, and you have the same protection as you do as if you had done this with um, options or with forward contracts. So now the question is. If we enter into one of these transactions, how are these transactions taxed, right? So the options, as we know, are capital assets. We've entered into this transaction to diminish our risk of loss. That's the whole purpose of doing this. So by doing that, the stra a straddle is created. Um, what happens when a straddle is created? We're never going to get holding period in the put that we've bought. Um, and also, if we borrow money against the position, the interest capitalization rules apply. And so we're going to have to capitalize our interest. This is where you want to make an identified straddle election um, because if you don't, if you've hedged only a portion of your position, you can identify your straddle, say that on the shares that I borrowed against, that's a straddle. I, I haven't borrowed against those shares. Um, those shares are my straddle. And on the other side, I have remaining shares, and those are the shares I'm borrowing against. And so those shares, I should get an interest expense deduction. Um, if you don't have other shares, what you would do is you would borrow some money against this position and then take that money, put it into an account, and use that money to buy new shares and borrow the additional amount with, those, with that money. Um, so let me give you an example of that.
So once again, let's erase all of this. And again, I've got my $100 million. I enter into a collar. And it's a 95-115 collar. And what I do is I borrow 50. I borrow 50 million. The interest expense on this borrowing is gonna be capitalized. It's gonna be disallowed because it's part of a strata. But I now take the 50 million in cash and I can buy 100 million worth of new stock. So I can borrow an additional 50 million on the new position. And the interest expense on that additional borrowing is deductible. But that has nothing to do with the strata. So you can make the best of a bad situation. So the interest on this will be deductible. Right. So this is this is something that can be done. This is what's good about using an options based collar because you can at least deduct some of the interest expense at the very least. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. So that's the use of options. If we have a prepaid variable con forward contract, same thing. The um, Strata rules apply. And here the interest expense is all buried into the transaction because when they gave you that, that upfront amount, they've already discounted it for the interest expense. So by definition, all the interest expense is being capitalized. So that's the bad news about prepaid variable forward contracts. The good news about prepaid variable forward contracts is the money that you get up front is not treated as a borrowing. Mm -hmm. For tax purposes, it's not treated as a borrowing for regulatory purposes. Um, so you have a lot more freedom to do with as you please um, when you get that money. Um, you don't have to use it to make other investments. You could go buy an airplane with it. Um, people, Mark Cuban, I think, actually bought a basketball team with it when he bought the Dallas Mavericks. Um, I think he did this with respect to his Yahoo's. He owned a company that was taken over by Yahoo. Um, and then he did something with his Yahoo stock and it might've been something like this. Um, equity swaps, equity swaps are useful if you have pre-1984 stock. If you have pre-1984 stock, the straddle rules don't apply. If the stock continues to go up, you end up with ordinary losses on the swap and you end up with long-term capital gain on the stock. Um, if the stock goes down early, you can terminate, um, the swap early and end up with a capital gain on the swap. And what you've been and what you'll then do is you'll reduce the gain on your stock by a similar amount. You, you are going to get a mismatch because the gain on the swap is going to be short term and you've reduced the gain on your stock, which would have been long term. But this is useful if you have pre-1984 stock, but very few people still have pre-1984 stock. Um, you know, that's almost 40 years ago now. Okay, so now we have one of these collars on and we wanna close it out because the five years is up and we have a choice. We can either deliver our stock or we can settle on cash. If we deliver our stock, we're gonna recognize the long-term capital gain um, on our stock. So again, we, and I'll go back to the whiteboard just and I'll go through numbers with this. Um, if, or you can settle for cash. And if you settle for cash and there's a gain, it's always gonna be short term. And it's going to be short term because of the straddle rules. And if it's a loss, it's going to be a long-term loss and you're not gonna be able to deduct it because of the straddle rules. 95% of the time, if the stock increases, you settle for cash and then you rehedge your stock it's very rare that you would deliver your stock when the stock increases in value. 
when the stock decreases in value, now you've got to do a computation. Now it's not that simple. Um, if you deliver the stock, you're going to recognize the entire gain on the stock, except the gain is going to be long term. If you settle for cash, you're going to recognize your gain on the hedge, and that gain is going to be short term. So again, 99% of the time, the gain on the hedge will be a lower dollar amount than the gain on the stock, but the rate on the gain on the hedge is going to be greater than the gain than the rate on the gain on the stock. So you have to do a computation. So let's go through some examples. Make this big. Let's get rid of this thing. So again, we have our hundred million dollars stock. So buy a put, strike price. And the strike price is 95 million. I sell a call, strike price. Of 115 million. And now it's three years. This is a three year deal. And at the end of three years, let's say the stock is at 125 million. The call is going to be exercised at 115 million. I could deliver my stock. If I deliver my stock, I have $115 million gain, and it's a long-term capital gain. And that's it. End of story. We're done. Instead, what I could do is I could buy back the call. Buy back call for $10 million. And I'm assuming that when I wrote the call at 115, I bought the put at 95 that the, the premiums equaled each other out. And if they didn't, we would have to take the premiums into account in determining the amount of gain or loss as well. But if I buy back the call for $10 million, that's gonna be a loss. It's going to be a long-term capital loss. and it's gonna be non-deductible. And it's gonna be non-deductible because I have a straddle and I'm gonna have um, $125, $125 million of unrealized gain on my stock. I can't deduct the loss, but that's not terrible. And now I've got a stock position worth $125 million and now I'll rehedge it. And then I can borrow money against it. And that's what happens. Like I said, 98% of the time when the stock goes up in value. Now, when the stock goes down in value, it's a completely different computation that you have to make. So let's write the numbers down again, 100 million. This put strike of 95 million. And call strike. Is 115 million. And we'll do two examples. Let's assume that the stock goes down to 90 million. Well, I can exercise my put. If I exercise my put, so exercise put, um, I trigger 95 million of gain. but it's all long-term gain. And at a 20% tax rate, I'm gonna pay 19 million in taxes. Or I can sell the put. The put is worth $5 million. So I sell put and I get $5 million. And let's assume that's all gain. Again, let's assume, right now, let's just ignore premiums. Um, and again, I, I paid for the put in 
took money in for the call, they equal each other. And just to make the numbers simple, let's just ignore the premiums. In real life, we wouldn't ignore the premium. But I've got, as I sell the put, and I've got a gain of $5 million. Now, the difference is my tax rate here is 37%, and I'm going to pay $1,850,000 in taxes. So in this example, I think it's simple. You just say, look, we're going to sell the put. We'll, rec we'll pay the tax on $1,850,000. We have stock remaining of $90 million, and now we'll rehedge the stock, and we'll go on. So that's, that one's not that bad. But what happens if the stock drops precipitously? and the stock drops to $20 million. Um, if the stock drops to $20 million, so I'm pulling out a calculator, I'm gonna to have to do some um, math that I can't do in my head. So once again, we can exercise our put. If we exercise the put, um, we're going to sell our stock for 95 million. And we're going to have a 95 million long term gain. Once again, that's going to be taxed to 20%. And we're going to pay 19 million in tax. Or we can now sell the put. But now, what's the value of the put? It has a strike price of 95 million. The stock went down to 20 million. The put is worth $75 million. And that's going to be our gain, but it's a short-term gain. It's going to be taxed at 37%. Well, 37% um, of 75 million is $27,750,000. So would I rather pay tax of 19 million or would I rather pay tax of 20 million, 27 million 750? I would rather pay tax of 19 million. So in this transaction, this is what we're going to do. We're not going to close out the put. We're going to exercise the put. We're going to get rid of our stock. So there's going to be a break even point um, where you're not going to want to sell the put. You're going to want to exercise the put. Um, and you're going to have to make that determination because it's not just where the lines cross over. Because remember, when you sell the put, you're still going to have remaining stock left over and you're going to have to do something with that stock. And if you then have to hedge that, you're, you're incurring additional costs. You may not want to do it. But this is the kind of analysis you have to do when the stock goes way down and your collar is coming due or your prepaid forward contract is coming due, your hedge is coming due. You've got to do something. This is the analysis that you have to do. It's not that simple or it's not that difficult, but you have to know that those are your choices. So you have to know what the rules are. Um, you're going to have short-term gain on closing out the hedge. You're going to have long-term gain when you deliver the stock. Right, so let's go back to the PowerPoint. So those are your choices when you're closing out the hedges. Um, just remember, you've got to compare the gain on the hedge versus the gain on the stock. And again, remember, it's not just comparing the gains, it's also comparing the tax rates. There was a letter ruling that was very interesting. It came out in 2004. So we have this hedge on. The stock was worth $100 million at the time they did the hedge. They did a 95-115 collar. And the stock went down to $25 million. Well, if they just deliver their stock, they're going to end up with a $95 million gain, as we just um, did on the whiteboard. If they sell the put, um, they're going to end up with $70 million a gain. And as we just saw, that gain is going to be short term. So those were our two choices. And we would have normally said, just deliver the original stock for $95 million a gain. But this letter ruling ended up with an interesting answer. And they said, what you could do is you could borrow $25 million worth of this stock from another dealer and deliver it to close out your hedge. And they said, oh, what do you know? That's a short sale. That's not your stock. 
We don't know what our basis is in that stock. It's an opening of a short sale. Our amount realized is 95 million, but we have no basis, that's a short sale. And then they said, oh, you entered into a short sale, but you own the stock, that's a constructive sale. But we look at the fair market value on the date that we enter into the constructive sale to see how much gain do we have to recognize. And at the time that we do that, the stock was only worth $25 million. What do you know? We only have a $25 million gain to recognize. And now I've got a short against the box. I have no more risk with respect to the position. This was great because I actually got 95 million of cash and I only paid tax on $25 million. So this was terrific. The problem is in 2011, the IRS came out with a new letter ruling and they specifically withdrew the 2004 ruling. And they said, we don't like that answer. And what they said was that the borrowing of the shares to make delivery actually closed out the put. You triggered the $70 million gain. And you have to recognize it. And then you've now entered into a constructive sale. And guess what? You've just triggered the other $25 million worth of gain as well. So under this, I'm sorry, 2012, not 2011. But in 2012, um, the service changed their mind. They came out with a technical advice memorandum. They revoked the prior letter ruling. And, um, and so if you're going to try to re rely on the private letter ruling that was issued in 2004, you've got a problem. So let me take it back. In 2011, they actually said we're withdrawing 2004, 45, 05. And then in 2012, they wrote a, wrote a new tech advice saying, guess what? This is what, so we told you last year we revoked it. Now we're telling you how to apply the rules. And under this um, tech advice, they said that you're just triggering all the game. I personally think the second ruling, the TAM is wrong. I think the first ruling is correct. But if you're going to try to rely on that first ruling, you're inviting a fight with the Internal Revenue Service um, and good luck. Um, depending on the numbers, you may want to try it. Um, but there's a lot to lose. That's the problem. Um, if I just deliver the stock, I know I've got the $95 million again. I know it's all long-term gain. I'm going to pay $19 million in tax. If I try to do this, I could take the position that all I have is $25 million again. I've only got $5 million of tax, and that's great. But if I lose, I'm going to have to pay the $5 million in tax on the $25 million, and I'm going to have to pay the tax on the $70 million at short-term rates. So there's a lot of downside risk if you want to fight the IRS on this transaction. Um, and then I want to close with this last, um, this, this last set of facts. So we have 2003-7, taxpayer has appreciated stock. They enter into a prepaid variable forward contract. So they're doing one of the transactions we talked about. It has a nice spread in it. Um, they give the stock as collateral, but they retain legal title to the stock. So remember, they're not doing a stock loan. Remember in a stock loan, when you give when you lend out your stock, um, you give up legal title and then the borrower of the stock can go sell it short and do whatever they want with it. That's not what happened here. They actually retained legal title. They just gave it to the other person to hold. They didn't lend it to them. And in 2003-7, the IRS ruled, this is great. It's not a constructive sale. Now we go to 2006 and it's the same facts as in 2003-7. There's just one difference. And the one difference is instead of retaining legal title, they actually lent the shares to the counterparty and told the counterparty, you can do whatever you want with those shares. So they actually gave up legal title. They can't vote the shares anymore. They're not getting the dividends on those shares anymore. And they already said, you know what? Let's take a look at the benefits and burdens of ownership of stock. And they said, between the prepaid forward and the fact that you've given up legal title to the stock, you haven't retained enough benefits and burdens of ownership of the stock. We think you um, sold the stock. And whether it's a constructive sale, we're not saying it's a constructive sale, but what we're just saying is under common law. We don't have to go to the code. Just common law says this is a sale. 
Um, so we're going back to tax 627, um, where this is gonna be judicial law, basically the common law. We're not looking at the internal revenue code. We're just saying, look at the substance of the transaction. You've sold the stock. And that's what the IRS ruled. Um, and they said, by the way, all the shares were transferred on day one for their, for their fair market value. Um, and then what you did is you also, um, you brought back um, a call entitling you to receive some shares in the future based on the fair market value of the stock. Because remember, they entered into a prepaid variable forward contract on which depending on um, the value of the stock, they get to keep certain, a certain amount of shares. So the IRS really turned everything on its head and said, no, you, you really sold everything today and you actually bought a call option. Um, and that's what they ruled in this tech advice. And what do you know? We now have a case with those facts. Um, we have the Antrix case. They entered into a 10 year, 100, 150 collar. They lent the shares to the counterparty. Um, and, and for the, the 10 years was because Antrix had just converted an S corporation into a C, I'm sorry, C corporation into an S corporation. And if they sold the stock within the first 10 years after the conversion, it would trigger a double tax. It would trigger, trigger a tax at the corporate level and a tax at the S level. And so they wanted to hedge the stock for 10 years. And then after 10 years, they would get rid of it or do something with it. Um, but that's why they did a 10 year transaction. Um, and so now we know that the IRS has issued that tech advice. They're gonna challenge this transaction. Anschutz is gonna say that tech advice is wrong. The 2003 ruling should apply and they go to court. And guess what? The tax court holds against Anschutz. And why did they hold against Anschutz? They said, Mr. Anschutz, your 100, 150 collar over a 10 year period is fine under section 1259. You did not violate the constructive sale rules. However, there's more, there are more code sections um, in, the, in the Internal Revenue Code than just 1259. Let's go back and look at section 1058. And remember, we talked about 1058. 1058 is when you lend stock. When you lend stock, in order for that to be a non-taxable transaction, you can't reduce your risk of loss. You can't give up your potential for gain. And so what the court did is they said, you lent out your stock, that's a 1058 transaction, but we're combining it with your um, variable forward contract that you entered into. And we're gonna treat those as one transaction. So once they combined that transaction, they said, guess what? You entered into a stock loan agreement and you reduced your profit potential and you reduced your risk of loss on the stock being lent. You now have a bad 1058 transaction. And because you have a bad 1058 transaction, guess what? You triggered all the gain. Um, and the court found that the amount realized was the cash that Anschutz received, not the fair market value of the underlying stock. So if it was a 90, if it was a 100, 150 collar, they might've received, let's say 90%. They might've received 90 million out of hundred million. The court said, we're not taking the IRS's crazy approach that you really sold for everything and then bought a call. We're just gonna come up with the normal result that the cash you received is the amount of gain, is the amount, is your amount realized compare that with your basis, and that's your gain. But the lesson that everyone's learned from Anschutz is that whenever a dealer enters into um, a collar, um, they're never gonna borrow the taxpayer's stock. And again, remember, so let's do one last, yeah, this is the last slide. So let's go back to the whiteboard one last time. Because this is where you really have to understand the transaction. You, not only do you have to understand what your client's doing, but you have to understand what the other side is doing. And, I'll, and this will also help to explain why Anschutz lent out their stock to the dealer. Uh, they really weren't trying to do anything from a tax viewpoint. But um, so I'm Anschutz. And I own the stock. and I enter into a hedging transaction. 
Well, if I enter into a hedging transaction, that transaction has the economics of a short sale. And if I, if I answers have the economics of a short sale and um, the other party to my transaction is my dealer. Well, if I've got the economics of a short sale and they're the other side of the hedging transaction, they've got the economics of owning the stock. They don't wanna own the stock. So what are they gonna to do to hedge their risk of owning the stock? They're gonna do an actual short sale. When they do an actual short sale, what do they have to do? They have to borrow the stock. And in Anschutz's case, they were borrowing stock that for one reason or another was hard to borrow. And it was very expensive. And when a stock is hard to borrow, it becomes very expensive to borrow the stock. And if it's very expensive to borrow the stock, who do you think is paying for that? Do you think the dealer's paying for that? Or do you think Anschutz is paying for that? And the answer is they pass through the cost to Anschutz. So Anschutz was paying the um, cost to borrow the stock and it was very expensive. So Anschutz said, after 30 days, borrow my stock. And why did they do that? Because once they borrowed stock from Anschutz, now there was no cost to borrow. And Anschutz didn't have to pay anything. So Anschutz was aware that they didn't want to combine the lending of the stock with the prepaid forward. They actually put a 30-day period in between them. And the court disregarded the 30-day period. They said that you knew from day one that this was going to happen. You knew that you were gonna lend them your stock and you were doing a collar with the same party. You violated 1058 and you triggered the game. So what happens now is if someone does one of these transactions and you have to do a transaction with stock that's hard to borrow um, and you just can't, and the dealer says, look, I just can't borrow the stock or it's so expensive um, the, the best we can give you is 60% as an upfront payment. Um, and the taxpayer says, no, I don't want to do that. That makes no sense. What the taxpayer will then do, what the brokerage firms will do is they will borrow the taxpayer stock. But what they're going to do, and it's a term that's used in the industry. Um, so it's a, it's a sexist term, so I apologize for that. But what they do is they say, we want a big boy letter. And a big boy letter is, is basically taxpayer knows, is aware of tax risk. Um, dealer is warning taxpayer. And why does the dealer want the client to sign this big boy letter? Because if the IRS comes in and challenges this transaction, um, then the dealer doesn't want to get sued by the taxpayer saying you gave us bad tax advice. Um, so they will have the taxpayer sign this letter, give the letter to the dealer, they put it away somewhere. And if the IRS ever challenges this transaction and the taxpayer loses the case because they go back and they apply the entrance rule, then the dealer knows that, they sh that they're not going to be sued by the client for the tax liability that's incurred. All right, so we've gone over a lot in this class. Um, we talked about what were the transactions that people entered into prior to 1997? How did Congress react? They reacted by passing code section 1259, um, putting in these constructive sale rules. Then taxpayers said, but wait a second, or investors said, wait a second, I still want to hedge my stock. I still want to get out of it. Um, I still want to get most of the money and go into a new investment, and I don't want to trigger the tax. How do I do that? And the way we do that now is we use collars. Um, and we can either use options, we could use, or we can use prepaid forward contracts. 
almost nobody uses equity swaps. And remember, equity swaps are death um, until 2026, because if you have a loss <coughs> on your equity swap, that loss is non-deductible. So you can really forget about swaps. Um, the two ways that you're going to hedge your stock are going to be with an options-based collar or a prepaid variable forward contract. Right, so that's it on section 1259 and constructive sales. And the next topic that we're going to cover is going to be constructive ownership. Um, and that's gonna be the flip side of this. Um, it's a different kind of anti-abuse section. Um, and that will be the next thing that we will be covering. Um, and that'll be the next class. So that's it.